welcome to Prairie Adventures, living and thriving in the Southeast Alberta prairies. I'm Coraline Gardner, part of the team of the interpretive program. We're managed by the Grassland Naturalists, based in beautiful Police Point Park. We're based in the Nature Centre, but we're not confined to it. We get out and about in Medicine Hat and the surrounding communities. We will be introducing you to some of the, the plants, the birds, the other wildlife, and some of the people that live in this area. Medicine Hat in the area is a great place to live, and we hope that you will enjoy exploring it with us. Today, the first episode is all about spring, tuning into spring. We've had a winter of snow and cold, Chinooks, sunshine, more snow, more cold. It comes and it goes, but now it's time to think about spring. The winters are always variable, and our native plants can handle that. They're adapted. The imported plants have a tougher time because that warm wind in the middle of winter often tempts them into breaking dormancy and opening up their buds. But then when the cold weather arrives, those buds are damaged. Our native trees are more patient and they're tough. They wait till past the Chinooks, past the April snowstorms, and then they leaf out. So let's go looking for some of the signs of spring that mean it's really here. To start with, we're gonna go find Marty. He's out somewhere listening for spring. Thanks, Corlaine. Yeah, it's definitely early spring right now. We, we notice the longer days, we notice the warmer temperatures, and the animals, the other life, they, they notice these things as well, and, and they're changing in response to the increased amount of daylight. And another uh, thing that we can think about this time of year is, is there a way to experience and, and identify this time of spring? And also recognize what our wild friends are up to as the days get longer, animals change their behavior, and we can really see this dramatically with the, with the birds. And here in Medicine Hat, we have many birds that are going to be present all year long. So they don't, they don't go anywhere in the winter. And as we get into the spring, they're already here to start with the breeding season. And then we have some early spring migrants that uh, get here and set up and start singing uh, early in the spring as well. So what we're focusing on are the males. They're the ones who are doing the singing and they're courting uh, their partners, the females, and they're also warning other males to stay out of their territory. And one other thing that I want to mention is a little bit about etiquette. So when you're out in nature and you're trying to hear sounds, it's, it, if you're making noise, there's a good chance that you aren't going to hear anything, and even a chance that you're gonna scare the wildlife or the birds away. So it's, it's important that when you're out there listening for things, try to be as quiet as possible and you have a much better experience. So he, here at the Nature Center and in Police Point Park is a great place to see the black-capped chickadee, a bird, again, that's here all year long. And during the winter, they are quite frequently seen at bird feeders. We see them all the time here at ours. And many people have s seen this bird in town. They recognize it. It has the black head, the white face, the black chin, and most of uh, you have probably heard the, uh, the year-round call that they do, which goes like chickadee-dee-dee, chickadee-dee-dee. But during the spring, again, we're concentrating on the males, so their sound is very unique and goes something like this. Chickadees are a little bit different than our other songbirds. The males are a bit less territorial. And then also the nest that they make, chickadees are cavity nesters. So they like to nest in holes. And they can excavate their own holes in rotten branches on trees, or 
they'll often be found using old woodpecker nests. So here in Medicine Hat, we do have a, a good number of wetlands, um, ponds and marshes, and there is a, an early migrant that not here quite yet, but is gonna be here soon. It's the red-winged blackbird. And this bird is only going to be found where there's a wetland. So you see here there's cattails present, good indicator that we have a wetland. And this bird, the males are gonna be singing and the females, the males together making a nest in the cattails themselves. And they have a remarkably unique sound, which goes something like this. So anytime you're near any kind of wet area and you hear that, you're going to be guaranteed that it's a red-winged blackbird. And the other thing about uh, red-winged blackbirds is the males and females are quite different looking. So most of the time in the bird world, the males are quite colorful. And this is true with the red-winged blackbird. Nice black color with a beautiful red shoulder patch. And then when you see the females, you'll think, is that a red-winged blackbird? because they're kind of brown with lots of stripes on them. They don't look really anything too much like the males, but they are a red-winged blackbird. Now, elsewhere in King Cooley, away from the marsh, is a great place to listen for one of our woodpeckers. We have four kinds of woodpeckers that can be found in the Medicine Hat area, but the most common one is the northern flicker. And the flicker is a bird that's here in our area all year long. So late winter, early spring, it starts to do its mating call, which sort of sounds like a laughing sound followed by a rapid set of uh, pounding against a, a branch, which goes something like this. Now the northern flicker is sort of like the clown uh, prince of woodpeckers in our area. Uh, people uh, often uh, have them uh, banging on the, the metal flashing of their homes. They sometimes will bang on the top of lamp posts. They feel perhaps that accentuates their ability to call to their mates and warn their, their rivals. And the other thing, and this is only going to last for a couple of months, so if it is bothering you, try to be patient with it. Uh, the other thing is, is northern flickers are a little bit different than uh, our typical black and white woodpeckers that uh, people are, are used to seeing in that their uh, coloration is brown and spotted. And uh, when they're feeding, they spend a lot of time uh, on the ground looking for ants to eat. The final thing about uh, flickers is they're very important for providing uh, cavities for other birds to nest in. So they make a hole in a tree that they use for a season and then the hole is still there for other birds. Uh, woodpeckers usually make a new hole every breeding season. So Police Point Park is surrounded by the South Saskatchewan River. And along the river you can find some of our early spring birds and you can hear them as well. Of course, one of the most well-known birds is the Canada Goose. I, I think that everyone knows the Canada Goose. And in the past, Canada Goose were almost entirely migratory. We wouldn't have them here during the winter. But be, because of, of uh, populations of urban geese increasing and open water being available for various reasons during the winter, we have Canada geese here all year long. But we do also get to enjoy them as they migrate through the area. But good places to see them are in situations like this, along the river's edge, or on sandbars in the river. And very recognizable sound is like this. Now the, the really neat thing about Canada geese here in Police Point is 
that at times they will nest in some of our larger trees, which is a little bit unusual for a goose because normally they like to nest right on the ground. And then uh, also uh, behind me, you'll find uh, another good sound uh, of spring are the gulls returning to our area. So you can, we have a variety of different gulls that can be seen here during the spring and summer. And this is a good spot to see them as well. So, so something that uh, a lot of you might not know is that you can see uh, bald eagles here in Medicine Hat. And we've had a, a pair nesting along the river here for uh, at least a decade. And they've had a couple of nest sites, but uh, most of them are confined uh, to the larger cottonwoods on the riverbank just opposite Police Point Park. And then you also notice that there's quite a few other nests in and around the eagle nest. And all of those were produced by uh, great blue herons, which will nest in colonies. And they've had some inter interesting interactions with the bald eagles in that uh, the bald eagles showed up, even though the herons had been there many, many years, and uh, took over one of the heron nests and made it into theirs. And the herons had tolerated them for a while, and then they decided to move to uh, a different location, which is where the eagle nest is now, but the eagles weren't here. Then, uh, last year, the eagle's nest blew down, they moved to where they are now, and the herons haven't been back to find the eagles have now come to a new spot. So it's gonna be really interesting to see, to find out what the herons do when they find out they have their new but old neighbors uh, yet once again. But come down to Police Point, you can see the eagles nest, and you can see the bald eagles as well. Here we are in the enchanted forest, and this is at where I come to look for the early spring butterflies. There are a few butterflies that overwinter as adults. They crawl in under loose bark or into a hole in a tree like this or into dry leaves and hibernate as an adult. Then when it warms up, out they come. So they're flying around on some of the first warm days or even on a Chinook day earlier in the winter. These butterflies are coming out, looking for mates, ready to find a partner and then lay some eggs. One of the favorites, one of my favorites, is the morning cloak. A beautiful chocolatey brown butterfly with nice creamy edging and a few little blue spots on it. It's called morning, not like early in the day, but mourning as in sadness or grieving. I guess somebody thought the dark color was like something you would wear to a funeral. But when I see a morning cloak butterfly, it makes me cheerful because it's a sure sign that spring is here. The morning cloaks, uh, angle wings and tortoise shells are the ones that we see first thing in the spring. And these butterflies are really tough ones. They can adapt and they can come out of hibernation and if it gets cold again, they can go back into the, the tree trunk or wherever they were hiding and go back into hibernation. So they're very tough and very adaptable. The ones that we see this time of year sometimes are a little tattered. And that's probably because they've come in and out of hibernation a couple times. And as they do that, they scrape their wings and the scales come off. Now they'll lay eggs and the caterpillars will grow up and pupate and emerge in late summer or early fall. And those ones will be bright and beautiful, full color. The really nice specimens. And those are the ones that will hibernate for next year. So these butterflies will live for about a year. Doesn't sound long to us, but in butterfly terms, a full year is a good long lifespan. So as you're out on your walks, watch for butterflies flitting here and there, showing us that it really is spring. Now, our next sign of spring is the Easter Bunny. What could be better than the Easter Bunny to tell us it's spring? So let's go join Lisa at the SBCA. So joining me today is Katie. She's the Executive Director of the Medicine Hat SPA. Hi Katie, how are you? 
I'm good, thanks. How are you? I'm good, thanks. So can you introduce us to some of the bunnies that you have here at the SPCA? Yeah, you bet. We have quite a few bunnies right now. We did have a litter of bunnies that came in not too long ago with their mom and their dad. So now they're of age that they can be adopted. So we have our two uh, female albino bunnies. So that's Kai and Ava, the two females. And then we have two lion head bunnies down here, Honey and Lulu. And these are both bonded pairs of sisters. And so what does that mean, a bonded pair? Well, it means that they need to be adopted together because they really enjoy spending time together. And bunnies, if they are a bonded pair and you separate them, they can grieve pretty um, hard, actually. And sometimes it can cause them to become sick as well. Okay. So we, we do want them to be that. adopted together. Yeah. And then we have their father, King, who is out and about on the floor. And we do have their two brothers around as well. So lots of albino bunnies right now. Lots of bunnies to choose from. Yeah. So some people yeah. might be wondering why we get bunnies from the SPCA down at the Nature Center every Easter. Mm -hmm. And the reason is because these bunnies are all up for adoption. Mm -hmm. So by coming down to our big Easter extravaganza each year, that means many more people are able to see these bunnies and hopefully they'll find their forever home. Now, what makes for a good rabbit home? Yeah, good question. So you can see, of course, like in this particular setup, we have two bunnies that have multiple levels. Um, so that they have enough space. So if they're being adopted together, you want them to have a decent amount of exercise space. But we also take them out a couple of times a day. They get rotated through our general room so that they get a chance to stretch and play and just you know see different things, play with different objects because bunnies do need exercise. And they also need to have pretty much constant source of food. So we provide them with Timothy hay. We also have different food pellets in there and then once a day, we also give them fresh vegetables. So they get lettuce, they get carrots, and they usually get a slice of apple as well in there. That sounds like they eat healthier than I do. Yeah, exactly, exactly. They love it. When it's time for vegetables, you can hear, because the guinea pigs especially too, will start making their little chirping noises. It's really cute. They get very excited for it. So now if I wanted to bring a rabbit home for a pet, um, just can you give us a brief description of what kind of vet care they might need? Yeah. you know. Our, our animals always come spayed and neutered, so our bunnies will, will already be fixed. And that's because we, we really don't need any more bunnies right now. We don't want them to be procreating anymore. Other than that, it's just watching for any signs of illness throughout their life. Sometimes bunnies will get something that they call like snuffles. So they'll have kind of a sneezing, kind of like a cold, but they do need immediate attention. And also if they are not pooping, as uh, fun as it is to talk about, or as much as we maybe don't want to talk about it, if a bunny is not pooping, that's a very serious issue for them. They have a very different gastrointestinal system, so they need to be eating all, all the time. So you always see them nibbling at things, and they need to be there for pooping. So if they're not, there's usually some type of obstruction, and it can be um, um, fatal for them if it's not treated. Oh, well, we'd want to avoid that yes, for sure. Um, and then what about um, grooming? I know what I need to do for my cat and my yeah. dog, routine nail trims, things like that, yeah. but is there anything That's like that question. I have to do for a bunny? For sure, same thing, and sometimes also their teeth. So depending on the bunny, sometimes their teeth will grow a little bit longer, so they need to have their teeth trimmed down, and definitely nails need to be cut. And usually they do have the type of nails that are clear, so it's not too difficult to cut them and you can cut them with the same type of nail trimmers you would use for a dog. Oh, good to know. So yeah. I can cut their nails at home, but the teeth, I'm the assuming teeth, that needs we, to be done by a vet? We recommend to take them to a vet. Okay. There's different opinions on that, but we always say, when in doubt, take them to a vet and have that done. And it's just a quick thing. It's like taking your cat to the vet to have sure. their nails trimmed there. Sounds good. So Katie, someone comes down to the Nature Center and they fall in love with these adorable bunnies and they want to adopt them. What do they do? Well, they can, of course, go online to learn more about our adoption application process. So that's www.medhatsbca.ca. They can give us a call. They can also stop by and ask for an adoption application form. Then we'll just go through a few questions with them and make sure that they're prepared for the commitment of adopting a bunny. And we'll go from there. That all sounds great. Katie, thank you so much for letting us come down and meet the rabbits of today. Course. And now back to you, Corlaine. Thanks, Lisa and Katie. Those SBC bunnies are quite the characters, and we always enjoy having them at Police Point Park. Now, we have other bunnies at Police Point, not in the building, but out here in the bushes. They're the little cottontails, or bush bunnies, and they like to live in an area like this. They don't change color in the wintertime, because of course, hiding under these shrubs, they wouldn't be camouflaged. If you're driving around the countryside and see their bigger cousin, now those are the jackrabbits and they do change color in the winter. 
nice and white in the winter, brown in the summer. It, we can tell it's spring because they're already wearing their summer coats. Springtime is when lots of us like to get out and take up some of our activities that we abandoned for the winter. And one of those is geocaching. Look what I found. Geocaching, for those of you who might not know, is a treasure hunt. We use a GPS, we go searching for the caches that are hidden all around us. Now geocachers will hide caches like this and then they post coordinates. So when you're out looking, you follow those coordinates and then you read the clues and you find the cache. Caches can come in all sizes. This is a medium sized one. It can be bigger or it can be a lot smaller. Inside the bigger ones, there'll be treasures that you trade. So it's a treasure hunt, but you bring things along and you trade. Now when you get little ones, the main thing that's in them is a log book. Because you sign the log and keep track of all the different caches that you find. And there's caches, geocaches all over the world. It's a wonderful way to explore the community. Your community or the ones that you're visiting. As I say, springtime is when a lot of people start geocaching again. And there are other summer activities. Geocaching is available in the winter on your schedule, but cold fingers, frozen caches aren't quite as much fun. So springtime, there's a real increase in activity. Part of what geocachers like to do is get together for special events. Because you can go out and do geocaching on your own, but every once in a while you want to get together and trade some stories and have some fun. Some of the events that we hold are called CETO, or Cash In, Trash Out. It's a way to help look after your playing field. And we always have one late in April, and it's a great way to come meet the other geocachers, trade some stories, learn a little bit more about geocaching. And if you want to find out about any of the events that are happening or the, the geocaches that are around Medicine Hat, you can either phone the Nature Line at Police Point Park or you can go on the Geocaching Club's website. The local club is called SEARCH, Southeast Alberta Region Cache Hunters. And they will tell you what's happening uh, soon, what's new, and invite you to get involved. Geocaching is exploring the woods and the trails and finding hidden treasure. Right now, Valerie is waiting for us out on the sunny hillside with a different kind of treasure. Cold winter winds blowing in again, but it is spring and spring with it brings with it its nice warm and fresh breezes. And of course that extra warmth brings on our early spring blossoms. Yes, I know it does seem a little early for that, but this is a time to get out there and start looking for them. We're looking for signs of spring. We, we can find it in the, the grasses, in our lawn, and in the prairie grass itself. But when you're out there walking around looking for things, it's important that you keep your eyes low to the ground or high up on the, on the hillsides. Because one of our first early bloomers is the prairie crocus. The prairie crocus is known by other names. It's known as the pask flower, a, a, a religious reference to the fact that it blooms close to Easter, and also the old man and prairie smoke. And it's called prairie smoke because of the way the uh, seed pods sort of twist up and, and uh, sort of look like, like a little gray smoke across the prairie. Now, to see this early blooming flower, you have to be in the right place. And one of those places would be on the southern facing slope. Yes, we're looking at a nice sandy area where there's a southern facing slope, again the coolies. But now on the north side, that's where it's gonna be colder and more sheltered. But we want the nice sunny southern side. And that's where you'll be watching for it. There might be some little bit of snow left on some side hills, but those past flowers or prairie crocus, would be poking their little heads up about this time. Now, when I say they're poking their heads up through the snow, you see a sort of pale flower, but if you, as you get closer to it, you'll see it's a bluish purple color. And it's interesting that this blue purple flower is on one thin furry stem. 
And this, this, this is interesting because the plant actually ha produces its flower before it produces any leaves. So, and it also is very adaptable to winter weather, winter, spring weather. By having, of course, the furry leaves makes it more warm and fuzzy and attracting the sunshine. And the, the flower itself is sort of a cup shape, and the cup shape will keep it warm in there, a warm spot for the insects to come and to, and to pollinate. So watching for those southern facing slopes, <laughs> you watch for the flowers. Another interesting thing about those flowers is that they also, some years, you'll have a whole bunch of them on hillsides, and then next year, nothing. Even years couldn't go by before there's any more again. It just has to do with the conditions of the soil, the weather, and there's other factors in, involved. But now the past flower is, is also interesting that it's also the, the flower of Manitoba. Now the past flower is one of the early bloomers, but there are other flowers that bloom early in the spring too. You're going to be seeing green grass poking up through the old prairie grass, and even in your own front lawn, you're going to see the grasses starting to pop up. Little, little bits of green here and there. Other early blooming plants you're going to find are, of course, the moss phlox. Moss phlox is going to be hiding the sides of the warm, the warm hills, and it's very low growing, and it's flat, and it basically likes to hang on there, very low to the ground, so that it's protected from the, the winds and enjoying the sunshine. But other blooming plants you have to watch for very carefully because they're very tiny. I'm talking about the tiny candelabra, fairy candelabra plant, and also the prairie parsley. Now, those ones will be interesting to see. And uh, I would like to ask you to go out there, get on the trails, walk around, look for patches of the wild prairie. That's where you're going to usually see them. And I uh, hope you enjoy the spring day. Thanks, Valerie. As Valerie told us, Spring blossoms are opportunistic, crouching down in the grasses, sheltered from the wind, soaking up the sunshine. I hope as you go out walking our trails, you're looking carefully and spotting those early bloomers. Let us know what you find. And as Valerie told us, the south facing slopes are the earliest ones to warm up. Third Avenue Hill above Kipling Avenue is uh, one of my favorite spots for some early blossoms. But the Ross Glen Trail, East Glen Trail, has some sheltered areas, a little bit moister, and that's where we sometimes find crocuses and other early bloomers. We're always interested to hear what you're finding, and we're also here to answer your questions about the flowers or the birds or the other wildlife. You can stop by the Nature Centre, or you can give us a call. Our phone number is 403-529-6225. And the Nature Centre is open Tuesday through Sunday, 9 to 5. We're always l welcoming you. You can also check Facebook or Twitter, all those sort of things as well to find out what's going on. But the best is to come on down, drop in and see us. Thanks for joining us on Prairie Adventures, and we'll see you soon.